Hey there, welcome once again to another edition of Strange Planet. And if you'd like to get deeper into Strange Planet, you might consider becoming a premium subscriber. And it's real easy to do. Just click on the link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. You gain access to commercial free listening, special bonus episodes that are produced exclusively for premium subscribers. You also get a subscription to my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm. Uh, I have uh, recently talked to uh, some documentary filmmakers about uh, Bigfoot and its paranormal attributes. Uh, I've talked to um, people who believe that Bigfoot is a, um, a, a peaceful, inquisitive herbivore that uh, simply wants to be left alone. Uh, what you're about to hear is Bigfoot uh, like you've never heard um, before. William Sheehan is a writer, therapist, Christian blogger. He's an avid uh, archer, marksman, fisherman, and he has compiled numerous accounts and testimonies of uh, witnesses to Bigfoot in North America. Um, and these encounters that he documents, again, not your typical Bigfoot encounters. These tend to uh, be, uh, let's say, chilling, frightening, sometimes violent. He is the author of 11 volumes, uh, well, 10 and counting. I think he's working on his 12th, <laughs> Bigfoot Terror in the Woods and uh, BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com if you'd like to find out more. William Sheehan, Bill, welcome back to Strange Planet. How are you? El gusto is mio. <laughs> the pleasure is mine. <laughs> uh, you just sent me a, a sketch uh, before the uh, the show, this is a fantastic, uh, very detailed sketch. I'm going to put it up on the, uh, we're going to insert that on the, uh, for those of you watching on Rumble, and you can see this for yourself. I mean, it looks, it's, it's, it's super real. I mean, it looks, it's photograph quality, this sketch of, a, you know, a giant Sasquatch head staring right at us. Um, where did you get this? Uh, well, uh in the course of the many interviews that I do, I was contacted by a fellow named Jeff. Uh, I'll leave his last name out as I always do. And uh, he was a guide for 30 years in a guide ranch and school that used to be located on the back of uh, Pikes Peak in Colorado. And uh, I spent six hours interviewing this guy, uh, getting all the details of the various uh, numerous Bigfoot encounters he and others uh, in the guide school and ranch had had. Uh, this sketch came from one of those encounters that he actually had when he was solo hunting. And uh, he had had a couple of paid fares uh, that was supposed to show up for a week with him, but their father died and they called up to cancel. And he had a tag, a personal tag to fill. Uh, and he asked the uh, foreman if it was okay if he spent, you know, a few days by himself trying to fill his elk tag. So he wound up going out into this valley uh, behind Pikes. Now, mind you, these guys had access to 2 million acres of private land and 3 million acres of public land wow. that was theirs to hunt on. And he went out pitched a tent in this little valley, if you will. And his plan was to go up to a rock ledge where he could overlook this valley with his binoculars and see if he could find something uh, suitable. So he had made his way out and he had to walk by three different beaver ponds to get to this ledge. When he got up there, he's hearing bugling going on here and there. And his eyes are drawn to something in the beaver pond, the first beaver pond that he had walked by. And when he sets his binoculars on this thing, which he believes is a large elk, and he thinks he's looking at it from the rear, bent over eating in this pond, hmm. it stands up. And then it turns around, and it was looking directly at him. So he puts the glasses on it, and that sketch 
He's at 100 yards with 10 by 50 German binoculars, which is like me looking at you 15 feet away from me. I mean, I could see the hairs on your face. I know what color your eyes are. I know if you got good teeth or fangs. <laughs> <laughs> and that sketch was done by a friend of his who has like obviously forensic artist capabilities after the fact. But this creature, he said, was looking directly at me as though it could see through the two lenses on my binoculars. It came out of the pond, started walking towards where his tent was, squatted down, and he thought it was actually, you know, doing a bowel movement. Mm -hmm. Got up, and he was wondering what's going to happen next, because all he has is a bow and arrow, and now he's got this monster standing between him and his escape route. Well, the creature moved, and in a favorable direction for him to make his exit, which he did hastily, he left his tent, all his gear there, and hiked back out. Now, it was a six-hour hike to get where he was, Wow. And he said he got out in four. That's how fast he was, <laughs> he was opening it. So um, did, he, did he have any any um, vitals on this Sasquatch? Uh, how high, how tall it was and the girth? Well, it, so it's hard to say. It's hard to say, you know, at 100 yards. Mm. But he said it was one big mother. And uh, the musculature, he said, was just off the charts. Now, this is a guy that has had uh, – a couple of Bigfoot encounters. Uh, and this one was really up close and personal. And when you're alone, uh, it makes it a little bit more uh, hair raising. Was it making any sort of men menacing expressions or movements towards him? Uh, nothing other than a stare down. Mm. And I had told him that I believe the creature knew you walked by it in the first place. You didn't see it. And uh, it probably was watching you all the way up to where you made your way up onto this ledge to look over the valley and had just turned once again to look at you. And of course it was looking directly at you because it knew you were there. Mm -hmm. I said to him, it, it was watching you the whole time. That's my opinion, you know. Now, could it have attacked him? Sure, these things can turn south in a hurry. But in this particular situation, uh, he walked away, and so did the Bigfoot. It's so, interesting. Yeah, uh, it was submerged under in the water beside one of these beaver dams. What do you what do you speculate? It was maybe looking for uh, um, a dinner, and it was going to go into the beaver dam, maybe. And well, you know, I learn a lot of stuff from the people I talk to, and one thing I learned recently, and I'm surprised nobody had cued me in on it before was that these beavers build these uh, huts or houses, whatever you want to call them, uh, on these rivers, and they go in there to hibernate. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that. I thought they just lived inside of there all year. Me too. But a friend of mine uh, up in uh, British Columbia told me uh, that the trappers go after them in the wintertime. Uh, because they know that they're in there and they can get them. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard that before, you know, and if anything, anybody knows uh, anything more about these things, I love to hear uh, the information. You know, I love to be more informed about what it is we're looking at and talking about, you know? So um, couple I think he, to answer your question, yeah. I think he might've been in there a perhaps eating some vegetation uh, on the bottom of the water, which a lot of the moose do, elk do, mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of critters eat vegetation. And who knows, maybe he was scoping out these beaver ponds for some of the little guys, you know? Right, right. Um, the other thing that I take away from this story is that Bigfoot have incredible eyesight. If he's having to look at it through his binoculars, high-powered binoculars, obviously the Bigfoot is looking at him through the naked eye, um, they've got great eyesight. Yeah, well, the potential is there, but we're talking about 100 yards. Mm -hmm. So, like, if I'm looking at you at the other end of a football field, 
just to look you over, just to have eyes on you. I mean, I can see you. Right. I, I'm not looking at details. I don't know if you've shaved or not uh, from 100 yards. But uh, Jeff had the advantage of the 10 by 50 Zeiss binoculars. Mm -hmm. So that brought the Bigfoot into view from his perspective very close. Whereas whether or not the Bigfoot had great eyesight or not, it was, in fact, looking at him up on this ledge from about 100 yards away. Yeah. Uh, so you have um, people reaching out to you from all over the United States, I'm guessing, uh, to tell you about their Bigfoot encounters. What percentage of them are hunters? Oh, I don't know the percentage, but it goes like this. Hunters, hikers, fishermen. Three, three people uh, that are the majority of those who are seeing or encountering a Bigfoot or finding evidence of a Bigfoot. And then the rest are very much, not that they're not random, but the rest are people like you or like me that are just going about some daily business and uh, run into one. Uh, completely inadvertently. Very few people are actually out looking for a Bigfoot uh, and find them or any evidence of them. Any now, evidence? Uh, go Sorry, ahead. go ahead. You go ahead. No, I was going to say, I recently uh, penned another encounter out of Colorado that was pretty intense. And I invite you to enter into what happened to this guy uh, because he is, when I say a real mountain biker, the term mountain bike came from guys who were taking these, you know, mongoose bikes and whatnot, and actually taking them into this rugged terrain and rat racing around and jumping off rocks and uh, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So hence the term mountain biking. Uh, people who mountain bike around me are going down dirt trails in the Pine Barrens. You know, they're not in the mountains of Colorado. He was on a regularly used trail by mountain bikers. And on one occasion, he saw some color in the dirt. He stopped and he found a helmet. So he stopped to look at the helmet. And when he picked it up, the helmet appeared to have dried blood inside of it. So he thought to himself, some guy probably crashed, you know, ass over tea kettle cracked his head open, left the helmet there, and, and, and got away. Well, later, he finds a bicycle. Mm. Now, the bicycle, he told me, had been out there for a long time because the chain was rusted, but he knew that the bicycle was like a $2,500 uh, rig. This was not some cheap uh, uh, run-of-the-mill kid's bike, you know? And he had thought to himself, was there any relationship between the helmet he had previously found and now this bicycle being left behind? And he thought to himself, even if somebody crashed, and I don't care if you broke your leg, cracked your head, would you or would you not have come back or had one of your friends or buddies come back for your bike? Exactly, yeah. It just didn't seem right that it would be left there to decay. So he is in the same area, and the helmet that he wears on his mountain bike is the same one that he wears when he's riding his road bike. And it's one of these helmets with a little mirror mm -hmm. coming out the side like a dental mirror Right. that when you're down in the crouch and you're pedaling, you can see the cars coming up, you know, behind you. So you kind of, you're in your safe zone. He's coming down this trail on his mountain bike and a flash comes into his side mirror and it's a freaking Sasquatch stepping out from behind him, looking at his mirror, in other words, at his back. Right. And it's starting to come towards him. Wow. <laughs> so this guy gets on the pedals like you can't imagine, like you or I would do, and just starts going for his life. And nothing happened. Like it didn't, it either stalled, went back, gave up the pursuit if it was going to be in full blown pursuit. Uh, but no harm came to him and he didn't see anything else of it. 
But if you think about it, it's it's very much like a mountain lion or a cougar would attack somebody out there. And they do get attacked. Uh, in fact, somebody was telling me months ago that mountain bikers in these areas now are doing what they do over in Asia. Whereas the men in Asia, when they're hiking through the jungle, they wear a mask of a human face on the back of the last guy's head in the line. Right. Because he's going to be the one that's going to get hit. Uh, and they know that from experience, unfortunately. So I was told that a lot of mountain bikers are wearing a face. There's a face on the back of their helmet now because they do get attacked by lions periodically. Wow. And Sasquatch, apparently. And and now it makes, makes you and it made him think twice about this bloodied helmet and the bicycle being left. Who owned this helmet? Who owned the bicycle? Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have answers to these questions, but it's kind of strange, isn't it? Meals on wheels. <laughs> Very good, Richard. As long as the meal isn't me. You got that right. <laughs> um, are hunters, do you hear from hunters that, that um, because they have a weapon, as opposed to a hiker or a fisherman, the the presence of a weapon does that at all um change the equation in terms of the type of encounter they have does it antagonize bigfoot well if you'd like uh i can bring you into the world uh of a uh another sighting uh encounter uh actually three encounters that all occurred in uh, Georgia. And uh, my newfound friend, Neil, and I make a lot of friends in this business, Richard. I make no more. I meet some really quality people. And uh, this fellow's name is Neil. Uh, I won't tell you the county that he lives in because there's only 538 people living there, I think he told me. And uh, if I told you, probably a lot of people would know exactly who I'm talking about. Neil, without giving you the entire backstory, uh, Neil is in uh, peanut and cotton farming. Uh, he has uh, substantial holdings as far as land goes. And he also has some properties uh, that were left to him or in his care when his... Uh, stepfather passed away uh neil rents or leases out these pieces of land uh as hunt clubs mm -hmm. so his arrangement is this that if you are in a lease agreement with him you are allowed to hunt deer and turkey in season you are not allowed to hunt dove he reserves the dove for himself and you are allowed to come to these properties any time of the year, day or night, to crack off feral hogs. You could just shoot them till you run out of shells or you fall asleep on your feet. And the only thing he asks is that when you shoot the hogs in the field, you have to drag them out to the borders. Because he said, if you run over bones, of anything in the field with the tractors, they could put a hole right through the tractor tires. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. And he, yeah. He told me that the uh, buzzards and the possums and all the, the other critters will eat whatever you drag out. So eventually things are consumed. So here's, here's what happened. When his stepdad died initially, he had become friends with some of these people uh, who were coming there to hunt. They had a, a like an old farmhouse that they kind of renovated to become a lodge. There was uh, room for a lot of people in there to bed down, to eat. And this one fellow had called him wondering if he had a piece of land that he could still come up and uh, work on, you know, as an individual. So Neil said, 
he told the fella, you know, I got a couple of hundred acres over by my house that I'll let you hunt on for nothing. You know, if you'd like to come up and check it out. So he did. Now, as I get into this with you, I want you to understand something. Neil hadn't at that time, nor has he ever seen or encountered a Bigfoot himself. This guy arrives and Neil is taking him down to this 200 acres to show it to him. Now, Neil told me this place was spooky, Bill. And it consisted of some woods, marshland. Uh, you know, he said it just gave him the creeps. So he's bringing this kid down there to look at it. Now, they're sitting there in the pickup truck. And Neil, for whatever reason, says, you know, if you were going to see a Bigfoot, you'd see it right here. Now, I told you, Neil never saw a Bigfoot. The guy turns and looks at him, and he says, do you believe in Bigfoot, Neil? And he says, well, based on some shows I've seen and things I've heard, he says, yeah. Yeah, I think there's people telling the truth out there, and this thing exists. And he says, well, I encountered a Bigfoot, Neil, and it was on your land. Whoa. So he commences to tell Neil what happened. Him and his buddy had driven into uh, his acreage, and it was at night. They were going to shoot hogs. Both of the guys had a 308 uh, AR-15 package with them. One was sporting uh, a, a night vision scope, and the other one was sporting infrared. So they were cracking out some hogs leaning on the hood of this pickup truck, catching them out in the field. And this one hog came out that Neil said he told him was about 300 pounds. Hmm. They took a shot at it, and it walked away. Now, the rules are you leave nothing in the field. So they had to go after this thing to find out, you know, it didn't drop dead. They had to find it and make sure it wasn't in the field, you know. So his partner is following the blood trail with the infrared. The blood shows up hot. And they follow it into the trees. Now, Neil told me these trees down there are a certain type of pine that they make the telephone poles out of. Mm. They grow straight and true. And the woods is very much open in there. You're not walking into brush and bramble. Like in daytime, you could see in. They walked into the edge of this wood, picked up the scope, looking through it. Here is this fat pig sitting on its haunches, squealing in the trees. In the trees? In the trees, sitting on its haunches. Right, right. His friend turns the infrared to the right and sees a large glowing mass. And as soon as this happens, the mass leaps from where it was to behind the pig and tears the freaking pig's head off right in front of them. Wow. He told Neil, we turned and we ran as fast as our booties could take us. Now, when Neil asked him, you two guys had 308s. Why didn't you shoot it? Like, to answer your question about hunters and guns, he said, I was personally so freaked out by the speed at which this thing had moved and what it did to that hog in literally a split second that there was no way I was even going to attempt to shoot or fire because who knows who would have won in that duel. So later on, Neil meets up with a fellow farmer who owned a partial of, big parcel of land that adjoined his. Neil hadn't told him about what happened. And on this day, he was with his wife in the pickup truck, and this guy came up alongside of them out in the field to say hello. 
And he decides to break the ice and tell him about what happened. So this guy says to him, well, I guess that explains Rodney's thing. So Neil gets into this conversation with, what the hell is Rodney's thing? Well, he apparently had a, a farmhand who lived on a house on the farm. And the joke amongst the workers was Rodney talking about the screaming he was hearing all the time by his house and at night. And the joke was, oh, that's Rodney's thing. Mm. You know, they called it his thing. Well, it goes on. This other guy in an adjoining county gets wind of these happenings and he decides to break out with what happened on his farm. One of his workers, they were setting up to plant a field and Neil sent me pictures of the tractor setup that they use after explaining it to me. And these tractors have these hydraulic arms that come out of the side and they drop down with like some type of furrowing wheels on him or something to cut these grooves. Right. And this guy had come from one field through the woods into the other field to begin laying out this field while the other guys were setting up the seed and everything, waiting for him to be completed. He got into the field, saw a Bigfoot standing in the field next to the woods as he was working was so freaked out by it that he put the tractor into high gear, whatever that would be, never bothered lifting up the hydraulic arms and tore them off the tractor going back through the woods. Wow. When he got into the field where the other guys were waiting, they were looking at him like, you know, what the hell are you doing, man? You freaking destroyed the tractor. He wouldn't talk to anybody. He was walking around like in a daze. And then finally, one of the workers got a hold of him, and he told him that he saw a Bigfoot out in the field over there. Holy smokes. And he destroyed $100,000 <laughs> worth of equipment probably. In well, the Neil, yeah, Neil said he damaged it heavily, and it had to be repaired. Wow. Bill, we'll take a quick time out. Bill sure. Sheehan, Bigfoot Terror in the Woods. Back with more in a moment. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. And we are back with Bill Sheehan, the uh, author of a series of books called Bigfoot Terror in the Woods. Did you say you're up to volume 10 or 11 and working on 12? Yeah, um, uh, 11 should be released soon. And once the paperback is out, then I can work on the audio book. That's how it works. And, and how many um, encounters per volume are we talking about here, typically? <sighs> Probably uh, in the neighborhood of 45 or 50. In one volume? Yeah. So we're, we're talking about five, at least 500 encounters yeah, that you've five documented. To six, five to 600 just in the books. 
And then how many encounters actually don't even make it into the books? Well, you know, it. I what happens is I, I do my best to interview. And then I have to weigh out, uh, you know, some people it's like getting blood from a stone. You know how it is. Some people just yep. aren't good speakers. They're not, you got to pull everything out of them, you know, and sometimes I sit back and I say, well, you know, I'll take a few liberties when I'm writing these stories to kind of make it into something Shut that's out. readable. Yeah. Flush you it know, out. That, right. That's why I like to get as much information as I can, whatever it may be, weather, circumstances, who you are, where you are, why you're there, whatever it may be. I try to pull out of individuals everything that I could possibly get. And then I go back and I assemble it into what I hope will be a readable scenario for the person, you know, who hasn't spoken to this individual, you know, and that's kind of how I go about it, you know. What would you say after um, nearly completing 11 volumes if you had to pick one encounter with Bigfoot that was, let's say, the most violent encounter? Well, there's there's quite a few of them. Um, and one of the most creepy ones, uh, I had named Washington Missing Person. Uh, these guys were working together, as I recall, in the restaurant business in Portland. And uh, one or two of them, now, it, it, really, the details don't matter, Rich, as far as me recollecting. But there was one or two of these guys that were into quads. Mm -hmm. And the one guy had a truck and a trailer. And they might have even had two trailers and a number of quads. And they went out into the woods for a weekend, planned to camp out, drink beer, quad around, you know, doing the guy thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently they all had gotten boozed up one night and uh, they woke up the following morning and uh, some of the logs had been pulled out of the fire. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the way it happened. Some of the logs have been pulled out of the fire. And there was a little accusing going back and forth about who did it to goof on us. You know, oh, you did it, Richard. You pulled them out to make us think like. And everybody was like, hey, man, I had nothing to do with it. I have no idea how these logs got out of the fire. The second night, the same scenario panned out. The end of the day, the fire going, drinking beer. And the one guy recalled being the last one to enter into the tent that the one compadre had passed out on a quad drunk. So everybody else was in their tents. He was the last one to see this guy who was asleep on the quad. And he just left him there. Well, in the morning, the dude on the quad was gone. And they wound up uh, having a search go on over there. Cops. The guy wasn't found. And uh, he told me that in the springtime, they were playing some type of soft. Well, let me backtrack for a second. They said somebody had said to him, was he wearing gloves? And they said, yeah. Yeah, he had leather riding gloves. And in the springtime, they were playing some type of softball league where different groups, you know, paid to get in, your team, my team. And on one of the teams, he recognized uh, one of the cops as being a ball player. And he went over to him and had a conversation about who he was. And, you know, you know, we were there that day or those days. And he said, so uh, 
what do you think happened there? And he said that they found one glove with a finger still in it. Whoa. One finger. He was like, what the? He's like, yeah. He says, well, what do you think happened? He said, you know, between you and me, we think the hairy man got him. The hairy man. Yeah. The hairy man got him. So, and you know, when you think about these things, first of all, just think about your finger in a glove. However tightly or loosely this glove fits, it really doesn't matter. Something had grabbed or gotten a hold of him, or we don't know if he it was dead upon impact, like the hog getting its head torn off. Uh, or if he put up some type of struggle and this thing just went, wow. yank his you know, finger off in the process. But just think about what it would take for you or me to pull your finger off. Wow. I'm not even sure I could do it. No, no. I wouldn't want to experiment to see what it would take, but it would have to be done quickly for it to even happen at all. Yeah, if it was a bear, they would gnaw on it, they would chew it. It would be, the whole glove would be, you know, yeah. It oh, doesn't... and there'd be damage. There'd be blood. There'd be, yeah. there'd be crap all over the place if a bear attacked you, you know. Do you get, do you get um, law enforcement contacting you and saying, you know, don't use my name, but strictly off the record, we know this is going on. We know the big hairy man is out there. And, you know, the there are many instances where we suspect a Sasquatch killed, ate, yeah, well, I, I I have a couple of encounters uh, that policemen had, and it brings me back to the uh, the Whitehall incident. Do you recall that one from Whitehall, New York? That that particular officer was very outspoken for many years about what had happened, and his partner wouldn't even talk about it. Mm. Uh, but uh, I have the encounter that I called Highway Patrol where this fellow, he wouldn't even tell me what state he came from, but I think he was from New Hampshire. And I'm going to tell you why. I know he was from the Northeast. And he was parked with his squad car at night doing radar, parked next to a rock wall. And I've been up to New Hampshire many times, and they don't call it the Granite State for nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, you go around up there, and there are just, there's granite everywhere. And they just blew these holes through the mountains to make the roads and stuff up there. There's all kinds of jagged gra granite uh, rocks jutting out all over the place. Mm -hmm. He was next to a, he started out the night sitting at a stop sign where he liked to give out some easy tickets. Then he would move into his highway patrol duties later on, uh, just looking to catch speeders. He had parked next to this wall and got out of his car to take a piss behind the car in the dark. Nobody could see him. He could see anything coming from the one direction, and to his left-hand side was this rock wall. Right. So nobody was going to see him out there. He wasn't risking anything. As he's taking care of business, he sees some lights coming, and he hears somebody laying on the horn. When this car goes by, he's still finishing up. And as he's turning around, something comes around the edge of the rock face. Now, his car is backed in, his lights are out, and this figure is coming out from behind the wall a freaking monster. Mm -hmm. He turns around pulls his flashlight off of his belt and his gun, pointing both of them at this thing now, and it flexes at him and ah, like that. He was going to pull the trigger, but didn't because, you know, you're a cop, you pull a trigger, you got to answer for the bullet, you know? Yeah, yeah. This thing looks at him, turns around, leaps across the road, and disappears up into the trees. Holy smokes. Now, when he 
he told the desk sergeant what had happened, and he consequently became like a a, a laughing stock there. Uh, he took it personal too, like you know, uh, he wasn't expecting that from his his coworkers, you know, and he wound up retiring after that. But there are a number of people who have called police to their property relative to reported Bigfoot activities or tracks being found or damage being done, uh, who had uh, local officers tell them, <laughs> really in no uncertain terms, that you're not alone. Other people have reported such findings as yours. Hmm. Now, would they repeat that to the local news bureau? Uh, probably not. But in private conversations, mano a mano, uh, we talk about it a little bit and then we leave it alone. And that's typically the way it happens. Writer Bill Sheehan stays with us back with more Bigfoot terror in the woods right here on Strange Planet. Stay with us. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Bill Sheehan, Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Volumes 1 through 11. Well, 11 will be out soon. BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com. Um, anyone ever claim that they shot and wounded or even killed a Bigfoot? Yeah, there's been a number of people. There's been quite a few people who have shot a Bigfoot, and those are just people that I've written about. Uh, who knows how many have actually taken a shot at them? Uh one fella claims he killed it. Uh, a number of people have taken shotgun blasts at it, uh, and they ran away on every occasion. Uh, I have one fellow that was having some problems on his property, and one night he caught this thing peeking out of the barn door. And uh, he had come to the back door after hearing some noises, this thing stuck its head around the door with its shoulder out, and he was ready for it. He took two shots at it with his shotgun. This thing went screaming through the wall of the back of the barn and ran away across the field. Wow. Through the wall of the barn. That's boards, upright framing, mm. gone, and did so shot. And he knew he hit it because he blew the end of the uh, the barn door apart with the shot that he, he threw downrange at this guy and close. Another fellow was hunting uh, pheasant uh, with a buddy of his, and he had his dog with him. And uh, they were at a soybean field. And the dog had gone into the bramble that divided these two fields hooting and hollering and barking, and he was trying to get him to come out because he thought this dog was going to get hurt, cut up or hurt in there. It was in deep, and he couldn't even see it. And it's in there. Finally, this thing launches out of the bramble, 
this Bigfoot pops up out of the bramble. He said that the bramble was about six foot tall. And this thing was a couple of feet taller than that. And it didn't walk or fight its way out of the bramble. It started to run through the bramble. Mm -hmm. Now, he had two barrels in an over-under shotgun uh, that was designated for pheasant. He put both loads into this thing at probably 25 or 30 yards, and it didn't even flinch. Hmm. Now, he he said that if you or I had tried to do anything in that bramble, you would be visiting the ER in an ambulance. That's how nasty it was. And this thing was able to run through it and be shot. I mean, what the hell are these things made out of that they can withstand? Do they have some type of super thick shark like layer of skin or fatty adipose tissue under them that can absorb uh pellets uh i don't know you know did this thing run away and then lay down and moan two miles away in the woods i mean we don't know we don't know what happens with these things but people are taking pot shots at them and uh i had the guy in the account the fifth bullet that had this critter run down a uh, a mountainside, for lack of something, uh, a better term. It was on a ridge line. He saw it, was trying to figure out what he was looking at, and it started coming down the ridge line and started coming across the level ground towards his position. And uh, he had a, uh, what's an M1 Garand? He had like a Korean War vintage rifle. Uh, he said he fired around basically over the head of this thing, like a warning shot when it was far away from him. And it kept coming. And then he put three more bullets at it as it was getting closer and closer. Now he is aiming at it. Pow! 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 Finally, this thing got to within like 100, 150 yards of him, and he put the fifth bullet right on it, and it dropped. Whoa. So that's why I called the account the fifth bullet. He reloaded his clip, walked up on it, and now he could see he didn't miss it with any of the shots other than the initial one that he fired over it. He had hit it with everything. And it kept coming. And he said, I didn't want nothing to do with it. I didn't want nobody to know what I did. He just got, got his giddy app on and left the scene and left it dead where it was. Whoa. Now, who knows what happened to this thing? But, you know, these things are out there in the middle of nowhere. Ain't nobody's going to find that. No, it doesn't take long for nature to reclaim. No. Um, in fact, I learned from a hunter. My brother was up by Priest Lake uh, in northern Idaho, uh, hiking with his bride. And uh, this is where a an encounter happened that was part paranormal to me and part legitimate. But my brother KJ had said that he and Karen ran across a deer that looked like it had been blown apart. And he was thinking... Let's just get out of here. This has to be the work of a grizzly or something. We're not hanging around. But a a hunter told me that he said, he said to me, Bill, after a deer gets downed or an elk or anything else out in the woods, even if it drops dead from age or sickness, all of these little critters are going to come out and start picking apart. Yeah. And as they're picking at this thing, little voles and mice and all kinds of things, that scene is going to be broadened over a larger area with fur and pieces of this and that. He said, it's not it's not like this thing was ravaged or torn apart violently. That's just what the scene looks like a couple of weeks in after everybody's getting their fill of it. Right. It's scattered. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's interesting what you learn from people. Uh, 
when you're interviewing them about things that you have no knowledge of, but they do. So it's really it's it's really quite remarkable this whole uh, Bigfoot phenomena uh, and who knows what about what. You mentioned paranormal, um, and you know you've heard this conversation. I'm sure many times that uh, that this creature is not merely flesh and bone. It may be flesh and bone, but it, there may be another aspect to it: interdimensional, paranormal. What are your thoughts on that? Demonic. Demonic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my, that's my take on the whole other side of it. I think these things are from the pit of hell. What people are seeing uh, that can't be explained. Creatures drifting across the landscape, leaving no tracks. Tracks being found going in one direction with nothing continuing. UFOs and Bigfoot, orbs and Bigfoot being seen simultaneously. Uh, there's only one explanation for that as far as I'm concerned, and that's just the, the freaking Satan himself trying to dupe mankind. Lying it's wonders. Lying one signs and lying wonders. Keep you guessing. Make you doubt. That's his specialty. And he's really, really practiced at it. And the more this goes on, you don't see this in just one area. Uh, I did a podcast with a couple of young blokes from uh, Great Britain uh, a few months back, and their podcast is entirely based on the paranormal. They're like ghost hunters. And I started uh, enlightening them about what they're looking at that they're calling shadow figures and uh, this, that. You know how they say, oh, these these little children have lost their way. <laughs> they must go to the light, you know, BS, my friend. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Get that through your fat head and you'll live a long and happy life. When you see these dark entities, these hat men, and especially when you couple that with feelings of intense fear, foreboding feelings like, you know, death is imminent. These are all things that you turn a little spiritual light on into your in your head as to who and what you're dealing with. My friend Philip, and Philip, if you're listening to this, God bless you, my brother. My friend Philip was a coroner, an embalmer, and a funeral home director. He was in the hospital a couple of weeks ago. And he said to me, Bill, this hospital is haunted. And I said, so what are you seeing? He says, I'm sitting here with the lights out in my room and I'm seeing full bodied apparitions coming and going. And he and I are on the same page because you're talking to somebody and myself as well who have had encounters with these types of things. So I don't, I don't have to explain myself to him, nor does he to I. I get it, brother. I understand. <laughs> and we had conversations about the hospital being a staging area. In other words, there's a lot of death that goes on inside a hospital. You know the work I do, Richard. I see yeah. it all the time. And there are two things that are going to happen to that individual who dies in that hospital or anywhere else. There are two beings waiting for that person, that soul. One is from freaking hell and one is from heaven. And they're all in the same area vying for the prize. So when you see them, we see things in my hospital. You know, the nurses are well aware of what goes on in the hospital and nobody talks about it, as are the doctors. When we used to be able to open up the windows in our hospital, which are now sealed, uh, the Spanish ladies, when somebody died in the housekeeping department, they used to open the windows because their suspicion or their belief was that this would aid the spirit to go out. It's a little weird, right? But yeah, God bless them, you know. Spirit can go right through the window or come back in through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 
But thanks for opening it, lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that that whole Bigfoot thing. And, Rich, you've seen some of these infrared uh, videos of these Bigfoot. Oh, with the glowing eyes? Glow, well, the glowing eyes is an unknown. Because it is possible that they could have some uh, internal phosphorescence. Uh, we have no knowledge of this, but I'll tell you, like in the fall over here on Long Island, I can go down at night uh, by the docks on an incoming or outcoming tide, and you can see the glowing squid coming by in the dark water. Right. Uh, they're bright green, uh, phosphorescent, and uh, very bright. Now, is that the only thing in nature that can put that type of energy out i don't know man i'm by no means an expert could this come from could it emanate from eyeballs perhaps maybe somebody out there knows more about it than i do but lots of times when you see those red eyes uh it's also attached to things like skinwalkers mm -hmm. you know and skinwalker ain't no living entity my friend skinwalker is conjured up by people and peoples who are well-versed in the craft, if you will, mm -hmm. witchcraft. So they have opened doors that never should have been opened and are difficult to close. And the result is, uh, in my opinion, dogman, mm. skinwalker people imitating grandma and calling you out into the woods only to try to kill you. You know, they're, they're false entities. They're deceivers. They're dupers. They're looking to do, they have a bag full of tricks that you know nothing about, and they're willing to exercise and use them against you. You know, so you want to play with the devil you may regret it, my friend. There you go. There's another side of Bigfoot. <laughs> you yeah. have heard. Bill yeah, that's creepy, Rich. Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Volume 11, coming soon. He's working on Volume 12, Bigfoot Terror in the Woods.com, the website. Bill, always a pleasure, always a wild ride. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, my friend. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. Hey there, welcome to another edition of Strange Planet, and it is a strange planet, more than we can possibly know. And uh, if you'd like to get deeper into Strange Planet, here's what you do. You click on that link in the episode notes, strangeplanet.supportingcast.fm, and then you, be you can become a premium subscriber. And there are three monthly premium subscription packages to choose from. Choose the one that's right for you. You gain access to commercial free listening. Love my sponsors, but occasionally it's kind of nice to listen uninterrupted. 
you gain access to special bonus episodes that are produced exclusively for premium subscribers. Plus, you get a subscription to my monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum. All right. I, um, as I've said a number of times, um, you know, it's not always about the, the land of the woo and UFOs and the paranormal and conspiracy. Sometimes I just love to uh, let my hair down a little bit, what I have left, and talk rock and roll. And yeah. uh, I am a huge, a huge fan of uh, classic rock, 60s, 70s uh, rock, and uh, that's where we're heading over the next 45 minutes. And I'm going to begin by cribbing um, from a book by a good friend of mine, Christopher Engelhardt. It's called From Grand Funk to Grace. By the mid-70s, they had become known as the American band with such classic rock hits as Rock and Roll Soul, I'm Your Captain, Some Kind of Wonderful, Bad Time, The Locomotion, and We're an American Band. They were certainly not for the weak at heart. They were qu quite literally, or they quite literally drove audiences into a frenzy from the outset with their bombastic sound. It was painfully loud. Michigan industrial foot stomping music. The music kids listened to on eight track tapes in their cars, dope smoking music. They were the quintessential 70 arena rock band helping to define what was later termed heavy metal. Initially, it resembled the movie Spinal Tap, but it evolved into something quite different. Again, that is uh, from From Grand Funk to Grace, the authorized biography of Mark Farner by Christopher Engelhardt. And uh, what a pleasure to listen or to, uh, to welcome the driving force of uh, Grand Funk Railroad now uh, in his 60th year plus uh, performing, touring, recording. Mark Farner, welcome. How are you, sir? Thank you, Richard. Good to be here with you. Proud to be sucking air. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. I love that line, Michigan industrial foot stomping music. Does that sum it up pretty much? Yeah, I, I used to call it assembly line rock and roll because, you know, all the auto factories around Flint, Michigan, where we grew up. And uh, but that's uh, it is definitely industrial and it's ass kicking um, and it's intended to be. <laughs> and what a hotbed, though, of, of music coming out of the, uh, you know, out of Michigan in the 60s and 70s um, yourself. Uh, Bob Seger, Ted Nugent, uh, Iggy Pop. Um, I, I'm, I'm missing somebody. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What what is it about? Uh, what is it about Michigan that that uh, is such a fertile bed? Well, brother, I think that a lot of it is uh, because the auto factories drew people in from all the other states. And a lot of people, like including my mother, who moved to uh, Flint, Michigan, because her dad got a job at the Buick, and uh, she was 16 years old when she got to Flint. But not only her father, uh, her uncles, her grandfather, her I mean, all kinds of people came from Leechville, Arkansas to get these high paying auto factory jobs. So there was an influx of Southerners who all brought their instruments with them. And every Sunday we would have a jam session either at our house on Davidson Road there in Flint or my Aunt Dorothy's house, my mother's sister on Normandy Court. But all the people would come and bring their instruments and the food was laid out and we were going to have Southern fried chicken with those hockey puck dumplings. <laughs> or we're going to have some sloppy Joe's, oh. but always, you know, everybody, a great time. Everybody was in a great mood. And when the music stopped or started going, I remember I'm just a little shaver, you know, I'm looking up at all these grownups in the dining room of our farmhouse and, uh, and just loving it because I was hearing the music. My dad played guitar and saxophone. And, uh, you know, Uncle Woody played guitar and, and Grandpa Cotton played the the fiddle. And and the, there was a banjo going and, and all of these instruments going. And then the women started singing. And it was like listening to angels. The family harmony was tight like the bark on a birch tree, brother. <laughs> Talk it tight and 
just magical to me as an as a little guy, you know, three, four years old, and these huge people towering over me. My Uncle Brian was seven feet tall. He had to duck to come into the house, but he could sing. And uh, and so it 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 I think the music um fr from Flint and from Detroit and you know from all the surrounding areas, Ann Arbor, Pontiac all under the influence of the n north meets the south there uh, because of, you know, the draw that the auto factories had. And in the north, we didn't have the segregation and we didn't have that that racial stuff going on. Uh, you know, I, I had black friends in Flint, Michigan, and we hung together. There was no, no kind of you know, slur. It was my brothers. I loved these guys. We hung together. We were very good friends. And so that in itself caused us to rise above a lot of the shit that was on, you know, and the rest, and especially down in the South, a lot of that that was going on that was uncalled for. And, uh, so anyways, the, the music, especially like, you know, Motown music and, and coming in from CKLW, dude. I mean, you know, Rosalie Trombley was blasting the all of that Motown stuff and the R&B stuff was coming across the river yeah. and it didn't stop at Detroit, brother. It came into Flint, Michigan, just booming at, uh, you know, out of Windsor, Ontario. So we had we were under the influence of all of this music that they played at the dances. And before I, you know, even played guitar, I went to these dances so I could dance with my sister, Diane. And we won dance contests, my sister and I, because my mother showed us how to dance when we were younger and we danced together. We were a thing, you know, we, we knew how to do it and we were coordinated. So I got that in my craw before I started playing. And then once I started playing music, I, uh, I gravitated to a more soulful uh, feel to the rock and roll because it was just natural. This is what I danced to. It's what I loved. I, I loved all of that Motown stuff uh, and the soul music. And, uh, and that, you know, what I personally, what I kind of, hung on to but i i did love the stones and the beatles and you know uh yard birds and and jeff beck and mm. and the early stuff from clapton like fresh cream you know that guitar tone that clapton had on that first album that that he lost after that and i don't know why man oh. that was that was really what got my friends and i interested in uh that type of music and uh, and and you know trying to attain those same kind of tones in your own uh, amplifier, whatever you were limited to at that time, but uh, I believe you know that that's really what it was, and and a lot of the people that made it, and including Alice Cooper, mm. had, oh yes, yeah, you know had roots in the South. Amazing. Grant, when I think of, we think of Grand Funk Railroad, of course, as you know this incredible power trio, but you started out as a five-piece band, as I understand. And if if it weren't for a, like a, a snowstorm in Cape Cod, we wouldn't we wouldn't have the the Grand Funk Railroad that we that we know now, right? That's right. Yeah, it it was. Uh, we were five-piece. I was not uh, playing any instruments. We had Kenny Rich uh, from Ontario. Uh, he played with finger picks, steel finger picks on a Telecaster. And we had uh, Don Brewer on drums, Craig Frost on keyboard, and Rod Lester on bass. And uh, two of the guys, uh, Craig Frost and Kenny Rich, were married. And so when we got socked in by the snowstorm, and went through, you know, a couple of weeks before we could get out of there. They, and we couldn't even call anybody because the only phone that was around, there was no cell phones back then, you know, 69. The, the grocer at East Sandwich, Massachusetts, 
let Don Brewer borrow his phone to call his mother, collect she Western Union some cash to a drugstore <laughs> up on up the, the coast. We hitchhiked up there, got the cash, rented a van and uh, threw all our equipment in the van and drove home. And by the time we got to Michigan, Craig's wife and 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 Rich's wife were both like livid as I, you know. What do you expect? <laughs> they haven't heard from their husbands for a couple of weeks. It's like they were they were ready. Oh, Kenny said his wife was like, you know, she wanted to divorce him. And he says, I, I got to quit the band, dude. I got to, you know, I got to keep my marriage together. I said, oh, I understand. So uh, upon the departure of the players, uh, Don and I are sitting there by ourselves. And I said, hey, you know what? We should do a three-piece band and not have any women involved with the players, not no wives for sure. And not even any girlfriends, <laughs> you know, whoever we get's got to be devoted to playing this band and devoted to the music. And that's when we got Mel Shocker, uh, who at the time was playing with question mark and the Mysterians. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, uh, so we, we started, uh, after we heard Mel playing, in Bay City, while we were in the outer offices of Delta Promotions, uh, which was the outfit that sent us out to the East Coast, um, we were told we weren't making any money. But then uh, we heard through the grapevine, after you know a couple of weeks of being there in the snow, that we actually did get paid for the gigs that we played, and we were paid three hundred and fifty dollars. So we were. We wanted to find out about that money and what happened. and But it was that whole adventure, just the quest of going after the money and a reason we wanted, why the hell did you do that? Why didn't you tell us we were getting paid? You know, you gave us this, this story. But in, in, you know, in trying to pursue that, we heard Mel Shocker playing, rehearsing with Question Mark and the Mysterium. We didn't know it was Mel. We can't see through the wall, but we can hear this bass like throbbing through the wall and the kick drum and stuff. And Brewer and I both agreed that whoever that bass player is can do the trick. We need to see who that is. And so it was Mel Shocker and Mel and I had gone to school together, played music together. We jammed together. We smoked dope together. We did everything together. Oh, there's your. Yeah. Sorry about that, Richard. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, the the uh the band started the very next week in the Flint Federation of Musicians Hall and uh we were all union members. Were you and Grand Trunk Railroad at that point? No, no. We didn't we were never Grand Trunk Railroad. Um Terry Knight had written a song called Grand Funk Railroad and he we were talking about what do we call this band? He said, why don't you call it the name of my song, Grand Funk Railroad? And that's the first time we'd heard it. And I knew that it was a playoff, Grand Trunk and Western, which runs through, you know, Ontario right. and Michigan and Ohio. Um, so we we said, yeah, that sounds good. And we just adopted it at that point. Uh, okay, so that's an that's an apocryphal story that's floated around that you were you went out as Grand Trunk and then you got a cease and desist order. <laughs> so that, that never happened. <laughs> no, we never did go out as Grand Trunk. All right, Mark, we're going to take a quick timeout. We'll come back and uh, delve further into the uh, the legend of GFR, Mark Farner, America's Band. Stay with us. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, 
Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there. And we are talking with the legendary Mark Farner. 60 plus years. This is your 61st year, I believe, right? Last year you celebrated your 60th, your diamond? Yeah. Yeah, man. How do you stay in, you know, how do you keep the, the pipes? I mean, you, you still have this incredible, powerful voice. You still have this presence and this energy. Uh, how, do, how do you do it? Well, it's exercise by reason of use, Richard. I... You know, not only in the shower, <laughs> but in the barn, out in the woods, I'm singing. Um, and and I'm I married a girl 13 years younger than me back in 1978, January 8th, and she is a health nut. She is really, she wants me to to make it. You know, she wants to keep me around a little longer. It'll be 46 years this January. Wow. God bless. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. So we're really into each other. And, uh, you know, the the food that we both eat is uh, pretty good food. We got a garden that we, you know, raise a lot of our own food and put it up. And, uh, you know, we always have uh, at least 300 head of garlic, and that gets us through the winter. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, we're garlic fans. Really, it's a, a natural antibiotic in that, and, and it's a wonderful flavor. And uh, all the onions that we grow and, uh, you know, the popcorn. We're into popcorn, dude. We like popcorn maniacs, but we uh, we uh, all... all uh, hybrid seeds or not hybrid what am i saying organic all heirloom we oh, don't heirloom. oh yes yes yeah we don't plant hybrid we're heirloom and we're uh n no pesticides herbicides or chemical fertilizers we use composted cow shit and that is it yeah so we're good we like it now i'm gonna ask you something i'm you get asked it all the time and if you're tired of talking about it you just say move on and we will um, but what is happening with, with you and, and Mel and Don these days? Well, nothing is happening with us as far as a band. Don and Mel go out as mm -hmm. Grand Funk Railroad and have since 2000, I think it was. But in 98, Don Brewer came to my hotel room after a gig we played and, and said, Mark, we all need to to sign our individual ownership of the trademark into the corporation where it'll have this protective umbrella. And I didn't finish high school, Richard, and Don had gone to college and was studying to be an attorney. I figured he was telling me the truth and, and uh, was out to protect the best interest of the band. So I said, well, okay. And he says, all right, I'll go to my room and get the papers. And I'm thinking, why the hell didn't he just bring the papers with him? You know, uh, but it never dawned on me until after I got the notice that I was no longer an officer in the corporation. I'm going, what? How did this happen? And and then it was kind of ganged up on me uh, two against one as it, you know, that's what happens. Even though I wrote 92 percent yeah. of music and sang it, uh, I uh, had to get the uh, the lower end of the stick and the. And, but I've had to let it go because uh, at first I was so pissed, man. I was going, how the heck, why didn't I know this? But I'd been drinking that night and, uh, you know, we had, always had a little few beers or drinks, cocktails after the show, never before we went on, but always after. So I was feeling no pain and and I just, you know, like I was, wasn't in, and, and that's, I learned since then that alcohol, the first thing it affects is your judgment. 
Mm. And it affects a hundred percent of the people, a hundred percent of the time it, nobody gets bypassed on that. So, and, but, but that's all in the hind and uh, behind me. And, uh, I have forgiven those guys because I, uh, I just say, you know, they're off the path that we were once on. Maybe someday they'll get back on it. Maybe we can bury the hatchet, still be friends. Because, you know, back when the Beatles were broke up, I was a Beatles fan. And I'm thinking, why don't these guys just do it for us, the yeah. fans? I wanted to see them on stage. I wanted to see them live, brother. And so I can understand why a Grand Funk fan would seriously like for all this to go away and for us to get back together and just do it for them. And I would in a New York second, but the other two guys uh, see it differently. And uh, I'm sorry for that, but you know, I'm not, I'm still available as long as we're all three still sucking air, we can do it. And there's only three people on this planet that can make that noise. And it is Mark, Don and Mel. No mm -hmm. one else can make that noise. And it, and as legal as it it is for those guys to go out as Grand Funk Railroad, uh, how honest is it? You know, it's like the Stones going out without Jagger and calling it the Stones. But there's a lot of that that goes on, eh? Well, I just spoke to John Densmore of The Doors um, last weekend on Coast, and same story. You know, that whole thing, taking he and, and Jim Morrison's estate, taking uh, Robbie and, and, and Ray Manzarek to court because they went out as, I think they called themselves the Doors of the 21st century, and oh. Jim was around. They had this deal. It's, it's, it's you know, it's four of us, and, you know, and, and uh, it's got to be all, all or nothing. So I don't know. It's it's sad because the music is has this wonderful healing thing that brings people together. Yeah. Except for the people that are making the music, so often you know the law gets in the legal stuff and all of that nonsense. It's yeah. it's so sad. Yeah, absolutely. And the the jealousies and the the envies and all of the things that tear people apart. It's just like a, a marriage. And once you get a divorce like that, brother, it's like, try and put those two folks back together. You mm. know? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about now, uh, Mark Farner's American band. And, um, let's talk about, uh, you just released, um, rock and roll soul live 1989. So take us back to 1989. Tell us the particulars where it was recorded and, well, it was recorded in California, uh, in a big field. Uh, it was to, to us, it was presented as a 20 years after Woodstock gig. And that's how they presented it. We had, uh, um, the announcer was Chip Monk, who was at the original Woodstock, you know, was one of the announcers. So, and he was, he was crazy, man. I mean, seriously that he was a ball of energy and and i look back after uh after the record company liberation hall contacted uh abby my manager and and asked about you know would mark be interested in releasing this i i, st I had forgotten all about it and they said it was it was a lost um uh, tape or you know back then it was it was tape recording and uh 89 and uh the video and and i'm thinking well the things that i had heard from back then a lot of them were were not that good of uh, audio quality and really not that good of camera shots and the thing that i like about live whether it is a live album or a live uh you know video is when i can hear the audience when I can see the audience, when I can hear them, you know, beckoning for the band, you know, calling for the next tune, getting that involvement that happens at a live concert, getting the energy rolling, you know, the waves of emotion that come to the stage are from these fans that are just adoring, loving beautiful, wonderful fans 
wanting to hear the music that they love and they're you know they're hugging you man from long distance and so that's what i saw when i saw this thing that i told abby i said have them send me a copy because i i was kind of skeptical whether or not it would be any good but i was pleasantly surprised that it's great uh audio and video uh blew me away that it was that quality and i am proud of it and on the on the vinyl record that uh, is a black and red splattered vinyl there are nine of the 15 songs that were in the set that night on the dvd there's all of them plus you know the the visual and on the cd there's all of the songs so uh you know the the ones that are that are still in stock right now i signed a few thousand of those things uh so you can still get a signed copy right now uh from what i understand uh, and i dude i got writer's cramp like for days <laughs> <laughs> days <laughs> rock and roll soul live 1989 mark farner American band and of course Grand Funk Railroad. Let's take another time. I'll come back. There's much to discuss. Stay with us. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete, unedited episodes drop every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, the Rumble channel is Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. In the meantime, I want to thank you for supporting this YouTube channel all of these years. However, the problem is I never know when I'm going to run afoul of the censors at YouTube. I never know when I'm going to end up in YouTube jail. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. And in fact, two more strikes and this YouTube channel will be taken down altogether. So help me fight big tech censorship. Enjoy the complete unedited episodes and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on rumble.com. See you over there. The one and only Mark Farner is uh, with us. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on to some other things, but I got to ask you this. And again, you've been asked this probably a million times, but I got you here now right in front of me. And I'm so okay. excited. But why the hell is GFR not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Because we don't have that brown ring around our lips. <laughs> <laughs> is that what it takes? Yeah. Yeah. We don't bow to that, God. That is not a representation of the people. So, you know, I think it's like we could give a shit less. If, if it were a representation of the people and and there was fairness about who was, uh, you know, even nominated to, to become a member, uh, then it, that'd be one thing. But it's not. It's totally political and... Uh, I don't, I'm not into that. You know, when uh, Steve Miller was inducted and uh, he called them hoodlums and crooks and thugs and because uh, they wanted like 20 grand a plate for his band members to come to the induction, uh, to the meal and everything. And uh, that it was just, that's ludicrous. You know, when you turn it into something like that, um, it's uh, just uh, that kind of overshadowing uh, stigma from people that don't even know music. <laughs> you know, uh, it's 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 kind of like some of the the jokes about the A and R guys in the music industry and and the the blind rabbit and and the blind snake run into each other out on the trail and, and they don't, 
So, oh, I'm sorry, I ran into you. I'm, well, no, I'm sorry, I ran into you. I didn't see you because I'm blind. Well, I'm blind too. What are you? Well, I really don't know what I am because I'm blind. Well, I don't know what I am either. So maybe you could, you could uh, you know, like rub up against me and tell me uh, what you think I am. And the guy, the so the snake, he's rubbing up against the the rabbit, and he said, he says, wow, you got a a fuzzy tail and uh, you got, oh, wow, you got long ears. And, and wow, man, you, you, I think you're a rabbit. Oh, wonderful. I'm a rabbit. Oh, man. Okay, let me repay the favor on this. So the rabbit kind of rubs up against the, the snake and he goes, oh, you're cold and kind of clammy. You got no ears. You must be an A and R guy. <laughs> <laughs> Great, you know that whole thing about you know not being there, not caring about being. I mean, you just that's the whole rock and roll ethos right there. I don't. Yeah. You know, it's like what Groucho said. I don't want to belong to a club that would have me as a member. Right. Yeah, man. Um, I want to move along and, and ask you um, about you had. I don't know how recent this happened but um this is going to be of great interest to my listeners because we talk about this sort of thing all the time and that is you had a, a near-death experience yes in 2012 can you tell me about it yeah man my wife and i were at the renaissance center in detroit we had gotten up in the morning and she went in and she is you know washing her face and everything she came out and down in the bed she said my arm shot up my left arm shot up and and then my leg shot up in the air she thought I was just goofing around until she saw the look on my face and my eyes rolling back in my head and she calls down and gets uh you know paramedics coming up and and they get a an oxygen mask on me and kind of put me back, uh, you know, get me back together. Cause I was out of, I don't remember any of that, Richard. So, uh, the ambulance shows up uh, from Harper and, uh, they, they take me over to Harper hospital, put me on an external pacemaker in emergency ward. And there's three doctors about, I'm not getting no more than four or five feet away from me with this screen that they're looking at on this external pacemaker, I'm hooked to it. All these wires are coming over to me and they're dialing and stuff. And as I'm coming to on this gurney and looking around, I'm, 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 I'm getting hit with this voltage. And then, and my wife, um, they hit me so hard. I hollered out, ah! you know, and she comes running in to, to the gurney. And she says, what's the matter, honey? What's the matter for I said, it feels like they just plugged me into the wall. Holy shit, they're trying to kill me. And she starts hollering to the top of her lungs. I'm hollering. They're not turning around. This doctor comes in from the hallway. What's going on in here? And she said, they're trying to kill him. They're hitting him so hard. He's going into convulsions. And they, as she's saying this, they hit me. Uh, with this juice and I die. I'm gone. I, Richard, as soon as I left my body, I felt the relief of every encounter I ever had with the word D-E-B-T. Debt consciousness was gone. And I realized in that state of being that every form of debt, and there are many, but I mean, besides the monetary debt, and that's yeah. obvious karma, but, but the debt of unfulfilled expectations of other people upon you. And if it's a family member, how they can team up with the, if they get to another family member before you talk to them and then that family member, you know, it's like they're ganging up on you. Why did you, do, well, how the hell did you find out? You know, it's like, it, it, it's very uh, the debt consciousness is it's uh, because it's our imagination. There's really no uh, representation here that we can look at. It's all our imagination. And even when we hold ourselves in regret, brother, it's like 
that's you're holding yourself in debt mm -hmm. and love says uh, oh no man anything except to love him oh no man anything and and when i got on the other side and and i was in that state of being i understood that to such a degree that every morning now before i get out of my bed man i'm praying Lord, love, show me where it's at. Show me where that anchor is today. If I've got more I can get to, I want to cut the chains on those damn things because that's what kills us. And they're not in our random access memory. They are in our read only. You know, they're back there someplace and they are accumulative in nature. The weight of debt is depending upon the individual who has gathered it there, uh, whatever uh, reverence they give it is the weight of it. And, and it lays there and it's just a landing pad for the next form of debt. And that weighs heavier. And then you get another form of debt and that's on top of the pile. And it keeps one after the other, after the other, hundreds of times, trust me, that was weighing me down and it was making me bend over with the weight of that damn debt consciousness. But I didn't, I wasn't aware of it. I didn't realize until I was set free from it. And when I left my bone suit, buddy, I didn't want to come back. I was, oh, yes. I'm right where I started. This I'm home. This is like I went home, brother. And on that side, on the in that state of being, I understood the purpose of the earth years. I had it, Richard. I had it, but I couldn't bring it back through the veil to to this state of being, to this human body. Uh I heard it referred to as it would be like plugging a 110 fan into 220. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you go into smoke overload and but, yeah. but on the other side, oh my God, the beauty, the just just that feeling of not having to, I mean, and as soon as you make the switch, as soon as you're out, that debt is gone. It's it's forgotten. You can't even recall one iota of it. It's so far from you because it is your spirit. It is your everlasting spirit that leaves this body. And none of the experiences that I experienced went with me. Only the love, only that love, man, and that is part of who I am. That's part of who I'm going to be. That's part of what I promote with my music, what I promote with my mouth, what I promote politically and spiritually is this love. And it's it's everlasting and it's unconditional. It's, wow. the, it's the shit. <laughs> Does that affect the way you play now? Yeah, definitely. I play with more passion now than I ever have. Uh, it's a more solid, my belief. I had hoped for it. And I told Lisa, my wife, I, for six or seven years, I kept t telling her, there, I'm feeling something. Like I'm feeling like I'm getting something. Like I'm getting something about this debt consciousness. And then when I escaped the bone suit, brother, I found out, all about that debt consciousness. And I was shown the second time I re-entered my body, I, I died twice on that table. And I, I recall the doctor saying to my wife, he's standing there with the paddles in his hand. He says, listen, we got him back twice and there's no guarantee we'd get him back a third time. We got to get him to OR right now, stat. And when he said stat, it was like, bam, mash 4077. It was people just scattering and and I was flying down the hallway on a gurney and uh the next day when the guy that did the uh 
the catheter on me. You know, they put that camera up in there and look at everything. He said, Mr. Farner, you have the, the cleanest arterial system I've ever seen. I've been doing this for 30 some years. And he said, uh, I did a 12 year old boy yesterday and you are cleaner than that 12 year old boy. I want to know what you're doing. I said, well, you know, the only thing I'm doing religiously is I take ginseng every day. I have for the past 50 some years and I, and it's a certain brand. It's called Ilhwa, I-L-H-W-A. And I take it in the extract form. So it's kind of like a tar, like, you know, like molasses looks like, uh, but it, uh, they don't use heat in the processing. So it's enzyme intact. It still has life in it. And that life gets into me and I take it every morning and I, I take a quarter teaspoon of coffee and I make a cup of coffee out of that quarter, quarter teaspoon of instant fair trade organic coffee. And uh, I put just enough cold water into it to, to cool it down to about 145 because I don't want to kill that ginseng. And I put the ginseng in there and that that's my morning brew. Uh but on his way out the door, he said, Mr. Farner, you have what I would consider a pristine arterial system. After he explained, you know, you got your arterial system, which is your plumbing, and then you got your electrical system, which causes your heart to beat. And that was the electrical system. I had a, a bundle branch block that prevented the signal from getting to, you know, the lower ventricle of the heart and, and making its... So now I got this pacemaker in there, Medtronic pacemaker, that uh, samples ahead. And if it sees I'm going to miss a beat, it'll throw it in there for me. Wow. That's <laughs> great. That's wonderful. Uh, yeah. I want to just bring it back to rock and roll for a minute. And um, yeah, uh, can you tell me about um, meeting Janice and Mick and Jimmy? I think there yeah. must be a story in there. Yeah. Well, Janice and I were good friends because uh, we just loved the way uh, I loved the way she performed. She loved the way I performed. And anytime we were on a bill together, Richard, she would stay and watch us if she went on first. And I would stay and watch her if Grant Funk went on first. And we weren't boyfriend, girlfriend. We were just really good friends. I loved her. She loved me. You know, friends, real friends. And uh, we were doing a pop festival in Florida, in West Palm Beach, at a raceway. And they were flying us in and out. All the acts were at this hotel out on the beach. And they would come in with this Huey that had been done up like a motorhome on the inside. It had pin spots and plush cushions and really nice, beautiful. And uh, so Janice had gone on first and she stayed around to watch us. And we were just before, we were the last act before the Stones. So uh, she was riding back on the helicopter with us and we're talking and sipping on some Southern Comfort eating some Hershey bars. She loved to eat Hershey bars and sip Southern comfort. It was just a thing that she loved. And, uh, and I joined her, you know, I was her buddy doing that. So we land on the beach and everybody's getting off the crew. You know, Huey's a big chopper. We had a lot of people on that thing. They're all getting off and it's darker than the inside of a boot, brother. I mean, it's like one o'clock in the morning and they got their little flashlights, you know, all the roadies got the flashlight and they're going up the path. And I'm kind of in with them and, and looking around. I'm looking for Janice. I said, hey, where's Janice? And I call up to John White. I said, we called him Ralph. I don't know why. But we say, hey, Ralph, is, is Janice up there? He looks right. He said, no, man, she ain't up there. I said, give me your flashlight. I got to go back down to that chopper. I got to see if she's in there. So I take the flashlight and away I go. I'm on the path. I go down to the chopper. It's sitting there going, you know, the rotor's mm -hmm. going and it's idling, waiting on the stones to come out. And I look up in there and she's like pushing down. She's sitting and she moves to the next seat and I'm watching her for a minute. And then I step up on the rung of the, the chopper and I holler, hey, 
And she turned around. She said, oh, my God, I about jumped out of my skin. You scared the shit out of me. And I go, okay, <laughs> man, I'm so sorry. And I get up inside the chopper and I look. And what she has done is she's taken, you know, it's Florida. It's hotter than a sheriff's pistol down there. And it's, you know, it's, it's the, the Hershey bars are melting. <laughs> they were when we were eating them on the way over. And she took what she had and smashed it into all the seats on this beautiful helicopter. I said, oh, my God, why are you doing that? And she looks up at me. She grins. She says, I want to mess up mixed britches. <laughs> <laughs> and this is back when he wore those white satin pants, you oh, know. Yes, yes, yes. The ones with the brown stain, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we both uh, often uh, kid around. You know, at the time, we kid around about, yeah, these English guys, all of them singing American English. Why? Who are they trying to kid? They're trying to tell us that the history of rock and roll started in England. I saw a program on that one night. They said rock and roll started with the Beatles. I said, oh, bullshit. Rock and roll started in the United States, and they all sing in our English, our accent, and uh, you know, the, the, when you imitate someone, it is the most sincere form of flattery. So, I, I told we always agreed on that. Janice and I always agreed on that. So, I guess you know, when she had the opportunity, she wanted to just make her little statement. Take the Mickey out of Mick. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, and Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, Jimmy was a good guy. We never talked about music, except for uh, the first time I met him. It was in uh, the Fillmore East, and we had played there. We're going back to the, the dressing room, and Terry Knight is lead, leading the way. He never led the way for anything, but he was leading the way this time, and he walks up to my dressing room, and push the door open. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking, wow, thanks. He never pushed the door open for me before, but, <laughs> but he did that time. And I go to walk in there and there's Jimmy standing there with his hat on and this big grin on his face. And I go, oh, but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, the most intelligent thing I could come up with to <laughs> say at that moment was, you're a great guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I was starstruck, Richard. Oh, my God, brother. And then uh, after that, it was like, uh, you know, and he's he was saying to me that night, you know, you you've got a extraordinary voice. He said, you are really uh, a soulful white guy. Mm -hmm. And he said, we ought to do something together. And I said, yeah, man, you are a soulful black guy. You can play this shit out of that Telecaster, Stratocaster, whatever he's got in his hand. He could play it, man. And uh, and we only had talked about it. But every time we got together after that, we never talked about it. We just talked about, you know, fishing and other things in life that are really important. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then there's the one time at, I believe it was Randall's Island, in uh, New York, yeah, New York City, it was a pop festival, and uh, he sent his guy, um, his right hand man, Rabbit, over to my dressing room, and and Rabbit said, "Hey, Mark, uh, Jimmy wants you to come on over. He wants to talk to you." And I said, "Okay, man. Tell him, you know, as soon as I get some dry clothes on, I'll be right over." So I I got dressed and got over there and I looked down and on the table they got looked like lines of snow drifts there you know this white stuff and uh and rabbit's got a hundred dollar bill rolled up and he's handing it over to me and I'm going oh no thanks mm -hmm. man uh, uh I've never done that I don't do that kind of stuff but you guys go ahead knock yourself out and Jimmy put his arm around me and he said brother Mark and you know he's way bigger than I was you know taller and I'm looking up at him. He says, you know, I wouldn't give you nothing that would hurt you. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is my guitar God. This is my guitar hero. 
I said, well, just give, I've never done this before. Just give me the tiniest little tiny bit. So rabbit had, he, he whipped his knife out and he goes in this switchblade and he sticks it in and got the tip of this pointed knife and it got just a dab on there. And he says, okay, plug your one side and, and I'll put this up there and you whiff it up. And so I go, I snort this thing up there and it went right through the top of my head, Richard. It went out <laughs> through the top of my head. And those guys get a stage call. So they, they're like whiffing that stuff up the rest of what was there. It was like gone. Like they were Hoover vacuum cleaners gone big lines. And I had put my packing blanket up on top of the truck, the equipment truck on top of the cab. And I wanted to watch the show because at that height advantage, I was right even with the stage and I was going to watch my guitar hero tear it up. So I go out, I climb up on top of the equipment truck. I got the packing blanket up behind my back. I'm leaning up against that box. I'm ready. So out they come. Jimmy, they put his guitar on him. And he, every time he went to reach for the neck, he was missing it by a foot, brother. Oh, and wow. I'm serious. He was so messed up. And that night, uh, this kid, this young man with no shirt, no shoes and socks. All he had was these bell bottoms that he had walked the excess length off the, off of them. They were all ragged out on the bottom, long hair. He gets up on the stage and walks up behind Jimmy, takes Jimmy's hand and his, his neck of his guitar and puts that together. And Jimmy looks over his shoulder, like to say, well, you know, like, thank you. It, but his eyes were just completely dilated. I I could see from my vantage point that he was screwed up. So once his hand came in contact with his guitar, he walks up and they they start this song, the bass player and the drum. And, and Jimmy's trying to play it. And he's not even in the same key, brother. He's not even close to making a sensible chord and not even a note let alone a chord he couldn't hit yeah he just couldn't hit it and at this time that stuff that i snorted up was getting to me it's the first time i ever did anything like that and i start getting like queasy to my stomach and he hit his echo box and it was going and I'm going, oh, my body's doing this with the echo. And I got so uh, lightheaded, I passed out and I fell off the truck onto the ground. I look up as I'm coming to, I look up and there's all these faces down or looking down as I'm looking up. I see all these faces looking at me with the flashlights, you know, pointing in my face, Mark, are you all right? Are you all right? I said, yeah, I think I got a, you know, and I throw yeah. up. And uh, anyways, I go back uh, to the hotel and I found out that what it was, was a combination of heroin and cocaine. Wow. And uh, that was my first and last time. Uh, I knew better but I stepped over, but that's part of what I've let, let go because I, I give it out freely as a lesson. And to anyone who is considering, uh, doing anything like that, I caution the human against such nonsense. It's, it cost Jimmy his life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It costs a lot of the musicians that I used to, uh, tour with cost them their lives so mark uh there's so many you know bands out there that that are playing grand funk railroad and you watching them and you're saying hey that's the wrong chord that's not how you play that's not how you play i'm your captain you know so you put this video series together to uh you know free to stream as i understand so that they can get the right chords for crying out loud tell me about this project yes uh as a matter of fact, brother, a, a, a guy sent me a link and he said, Farner, is this really how you play Sin's a Good Man's Brother? And I watched the link and 
it's all wrong. It's all the wrong chords, not even close. But he thinks that they, and he's trying, he's using this video as teaching someone. It's a lesson to learn how to play grand funk. And I'm thinking, wow, man, I got to do something about this. Uh, but I, I watched a lot of videos after I watched that one. I stayed on the YouTube and there was a bunch of them, people doing sins, a good man's brother. I, and I was an hour and a half, two hours watching videos and none of them did it close to, to being right. Uh, so I called my friend, Jimmy Romeo, uh, down in Detroit. And I said, Jimmy, he's a videographer and a great sax player and singer. And I said, Jimmy, I got an idea. And I told him the story about the link and everything and how it was wrong. I said, I would like to correct that and eat and just do put it out myself and show people the chords that I made. Cause these chords that I do, I just sound them out and, and stretch my finger to make, you know, the chord, the note that I'm looking for. And, uh, he said, that's a great idea. And I said, I don't want to charge anything for them. I want to give them my reward will be people playing my songs correctly. That, that would be my reward. And, and so, he said, that's even more of a motivator. Motivator, He says, uh, I'll get two cameras on you. We'll shoot your right hand, your left hand, and we'll, we'll get some, you know, some footage. We'll start doing some songs. So we got about 23 songs uh, recorded, and, uh, and we're releasing, you know, one at a time. And, and leaving it up for three or four months and then releasing another one and uh, keyboard songs as well. But the people that have uh, taken advantage of this and have, uh, and it's not for beginners at, at all, Richard, it is for uh, guitar players that can play and keyboard players that are players. Uh, yeah. but just to, just to determine the correct chords, even on uh, foot stomping music, there's been a lot of great keyboard players that I've played out with, and they go to play that opening, bah, 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 and not one has ever hit it correctly. The, the chords that I used were different. I'm a guitar player that's a keyboard player, so <laughs> I come from a different place. Uh, but uh, people, you know, I'm, I uh, am an endorser of Hammond organs of Hammond, and a guy... Uh, Scott May was uh, one of the guys that, that wasn't doing it right. And I showed him how to, to do it. And he was so thankful. And uh, he said, man, you know, I'd have never figured that out. It just sounded like it was this, you know. And I said, well, you're not the only one, Scott. And he's a very accomplished keyboard player and guitar player and singer. I mean, he's a musician. Uh, but he was so thankful to to learn the right chords. And Hopefully, these people that are learning and and telling me how great it is that I'm I'm doing this, uh, hopefully, when they play it properly and they and the listener hears the right chords, it's going to pay off for them because it's already paid off for me. What's uh, 2024 shaping up to look like for you, Mark? It's uh. We've got a offer to go to South America. I think we're going to go to South America in the spring. Uh, I've been working on an LP for the last, it'll be two years this spring. I've been working with Mark Slaughter from the group Slaughter. And uh, he is part uh, Native American as well. So we we uh, hook up as brothers and uh, he's a, a rocker, man. He's a serious rocker and he's producing my record as well as accompanying me with some of the background vocals he uh is co-writer on one of the songs that uh that's a great song that we we did together and we're doing it part of it down at his place in tennessee and then i sit here in michigan and uh, do songs on my uh, mark of the unicorn digital performer and then i send that to the to the uh Dropbox and he downloads the file from Dropbox <laughs> into his uh, recording stuff down there. And we, we get some tracks done that way. 
Uh, but he performs and I perform. So this has been a long time coming, but brother, I am so excited about this music. I think you would love it. It's, it's, it's saying something. This music is not just fluffy shit. It is saying something. This is, yeah. Can't wait. Can't wait. And um, the, um, the video series, Farner Chords, is, is that to be found on YouTube at Mark, Mark Farner or markfarner.com or how do we? Markfarner.com. Yeah. It, it's, it's free. Just if you want to learn, if you want to see, even people that don't even play have gone over there just to watch because there are some funny things that happen while you're recording and some funny stories that come out. And uh, so people have been commenting on that as well, brother. Mark, what a, uh, a real thrill to uh, speak with you and uh, hang out with you for the last hour. I really appreciate it. We're going to do this again uh, real soon on Coast to Coast. Yeah, sounds good, brother. Good to be with you, Richard. Hi there. If you want to watch the rest of these episodes, please head over to my Rumble channel, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet. You can watch complete episodes there. New, complete unedited episodes drop every monday wednesday and friday again the rumble channel is richard Serrett's strange planet in the meantime i want to thank you for supporting this youtube channel all of these years however the problem is i never know when i'm going to run afoul of the censors at youtube i never know when i'm going to end up in youtube jail there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason and in fact two more strikes and this youtube channel will be taken down altogether so Help me fight big tech censorship, enjoy the complete unedited episodes, and join the rest of the Strange Planet community over on Rumble. Again, Richard Serrett's Strange Planet on Rumble.com. See you over there.